Well, as you can see, I've got my lab bench set up again. Um, and that means that with some luck, uh, I'll have time to get back to the hardware work and in particular um, to start up again looking at the video chip, which is what I was working on last time to try to get some video output from my computer. But I haven't gotten to that yet. So I figured that while we're all engaged in this long wait for some more interesting content, what I would do was give a very basic overview of the hardware architecture of the might. Just um, the basic sort of theory of operation. How, what are all the pieces and how are they plugged together? This is fairly simplistic stuff, but um, maybe some of you don't know quite how this works. So I thought I would just talk through it. So the starting point, of course, is the 6502 processor. So this this is the, the microprocessor at the heart of the machine. This is where all the computational tasks take place. This is the part that's actually executing instructions and, um, and doing all the work. But it can't do all that work by itself. There must be more things going on in the computer, and in particular, we need some memory. And that's memory both for storing programs that we're going to execute and for storing data that those programs are going to operate on. So there are two types of memory in this computer. Um, there is ROM or read-only memory. Um, in particular, in my case, I'm using EEPROM, uh, which is electrically erasable, so you can change it. But by and large, ROM is um, permanent memory, so, so things that stay, think basically memory that holds its content when the power is turned off. And RAM or random access memory, which is volatile memory. Um, that's memory that uh, loses its contents when the power is turned when the power is turned off. Um, so ROM, the program can read and write memory in the RAM, but it, the, the the processor itself can't change the memory that's in the ROM. So the ROM is the ROM is semi semi permanent. Okay, so those pieces are all part of the computer. How do they fit together? Um, well, they are they fit together through two communication channels, um, or, or which are known as buses, um, and these are two channels that operate in slightly different ways. This one is what's called the data bus, and this one is what's called the address bus. And um, the data bus is eight bits wide. So there are eight bits, uh, eight channels here, individual bits um, in running in parallel. So that there are eight lines that run into the 6502 that are the data lines. Um, and the address bus is 16 bits wide. Um, so basically what's happening is the address bus is used to address, that is to signal, um, uh, different parts of memory. Since there are 16 bits, which allows you to write values in the range of 0 through 65535, roughly 64, that's 64k, 64 kilobits or kilobytes. That's why 6502 processors are limited to an address space of 64K. The total of the ROM and the RAM and other things, as I'll show you in a moment, um, has to come to 64K. So in my computer, I have, um, I have roughly 32K each of, of, of ROM and RAM. So what's happening here? is that when the 6502 wants to read or write from some memory, it puts the address that it wants to read or write, basically uh, a 16-bit number, onto the address bus. Um, and so let's imagine that it's reading uh, from, from memory and it's reading from an address that's in the ROM. It puts it, the address that it wants to read onto the address bus and so that the various memories see it and in this case, the ROM will um, write back the value that it um, 
uh, that it uh, at, that's at stored at that location onto the data bus, and that way it flows back to the back to the processor. So actually, I should draw this arrow just going one way because the ROM can't read. Uh, the ROM can only put things onto the data bus. It's not going to read things in from the data bus. So we can read and write particular addresses. The 6502 can also write to an address. So if we want to write to an address in RAM, the 6502 puts the address onto the address bus and puts the data onto the data bus and signals the RAM to read that data. And then that data will be stored into the, into the RAM. So the 6502 accesses memory um, both for reading and for writing by putting an address onto the address bus. And then the data flows either in this direction or in that direction along the data bus. And so the data bus is the, um, uh, the data and address buses are the two primary channels by which the various elements in the computer system talk to each other. Now we've got the processor and we've got some memory. But those are not the only parts to the computer system. There are also, um, you know, we also have a serial line. So we have a chip known as the asynchronous communication interface adapter. This is the 6551 is the chip that I'm using. And I actually have a couple of chips which are both Versatile inter interface adapters, um, that's the 6522 is the chip that's in the 6502 family that does that. So the ACIA gives me serial input and output, that's so I can talk to it from a terminal. And the VIAs um, have some general purpose I.O. So I use one of my VIAs, for instance, for talking to the SD card and getting input and output through that. So how, does, how do they come into, um, into the system? How does the 6502 address those? Well, there are diff different chips have different ways of doing this, but the way the 6502 does it is through what's called um, memory mapped. IO, which means that the input and output devices actually appear like memory. They appear in the same address space. And so in fact, they are also connected to the address bus and the data bus, and they operate in exactly the same way as memory. So for instance, if the 6502 wants to output a character to the serial line, it puts the character it wants to output onto the data line, and it right and it onto the address bus, it puts the address, there's a special address in here, which is the output register. And whenever you put data into that um, address, it will appear on the serial line. And whenever you read from it, you will read the most recent character that's just been entered. So I can read data into and out of um, the serial line, input into and out of the terminal, using just the same address and data bus mechanism that's been used by the 6502 to address memory. Just the same thing happens with the VIAs. There's a special address, which is the um, output port um, of a VIA. Um, and whenever the 6502 wants to use that VIA, it writes the address for that VIA, um, for that port, for that, um, port um, onto the address line, and it uses the data line either to control the output or to read the input from that, um, from that element. So this mechanism for mapping all these input devices, input and output devices into memory, making them appear just like um, other kinds of memory, this is known as um, memory mapped I.O. Everything appears within the same address space. That's why I said I actually don't have exactly 32K of ROM and RAM. If I had 32K of ROM and 32K of RAM, my 64K address space would be full. I actually need to leave a small part of it to make space where, for where the serial line and the um, input output units are.
So I actually have, I think I've got 32K of RAM and 28K of ROM and a little bit of space is taken, 4K is taken, um, taken up to, uh, to map these things into. Okay, so that's one part of the problem. So a lot of the, the basic architecture, but there's a problem still remaining, which is I've got all these different kinds of elements. How do they know when, uh, which part is to be, which device is to be mapped into which part of memory? Well, um, there's an, another component in here that I need to um, add in. Um, and we'll call this, uh, I'll just call this decode. And so this is a piece of logic that, um, uh, that's called the address decoding unit. And address decoding basically figures out which of these elements should be active at any given moment. So how does that, op how does that work? Well, the decode unit also reads the address line, just like um, everything else. And the decode unit knows what part of memory each of these elements should be mapped into. Um, and it turns out that each of these, um, uh, each of these chips has, um, uh, has a special, let's just put it here. Each of these chips has um, a, an input line known as its enable line. And it only operates when it's enabled. It only operates when it, um, uh, when it receives a signal that turns it on. And it's the decode logic that does that. The decode logic has separate lines that run to each, each of the uh, enable lines, the enable lines on each, um, on each chip. And essentially the decode logic turns these on and off at different moments depending on the address that's written on the um, written on the, the on the, the serial line there's a variety of different ways to make this decode um, logic work um, most commonly the simplest thing is simply to have a series of um, 74 log uh, 74 series logic chips and ors um, uh, NAND gates that will um, use parts of the address space in order to turn on or on different kinds of different kinds of elements. So, for example, in um, my computer, if I have the RAM occupy the lower 32k of the address space, and so the simplest way that I can do that is to say, if um, if address line 15 which is the, the, number, the, the top address line, the most significant bit is zero, then enable the RAM. And so that basically means the RAM is enabled anytime I'm reading or writing to the lower half of the memory I'm writing, because this is a zero. If it was a one, it would be the upper half. And then you can have more complicated logic that determines when different, um, different address lines are, um, are turned on. I actually I used to do that in the first version of the computer that I built on a breadboard. I would do that with 74LS logic, um, uh, actually AC logic. But these days, it's actually um, it's in what's called uh, generic array logic. It's a programmable device that, um, ha that that in a single chip will have more complicated set of it. Um, a uh, set of rules that basically tell it where these, um, when these different chips should be turned on. That's basically the entire chip count of my computer. There is one chip for the CPU. There is one chip for the EEPROM. There is one chip for the RAM. These are each one chip each. There is one chip for decode because it's all it's multiple chips that have been compressed into this GAL. Um, there are actually two other um, things that look a little bit like chips, which are the clock input. So the ACIA has a clock input and the 6502 has a clock input. Um, and that clock input for the 6502 actually goes to many of these other devices too. Um, and that's it. That's the entire computer there. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine um, things that look like chips. These, these sort of look vaguely like chips. 
um, on the board and that's how all those different pieces are, um, are put together and that's how the, the, the hardware connects and the hardware interoperates. Um, maybe in, uh, in another uh, video I'll show you something about how the software architecture operates but I just wanted to show you something about how all this goes on. Maybe this would have been a better video to post first before I even started um, um, making things go but this maybe makes a little more sense to you now especially if you look back at the early videos the very first thing that was operating was just the 6502 in, in, um, in what was called free running mode um, and then we added in some, some ROM and then we added in some RAM and we added these, one, these, these chips bit by bit in order to sort of produce this, this, uh, this, this larger architecture. Um, but this is the basic mechanism whereby the, uh, the, the processor works.